Well, the Royals signed somebody to a major league contract. Who is that and what do we think? We'll tell you next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned into another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. We're also live on TikTok and Instagram, so give us a follow over there at Locked underscore on underscore Royals. Also very easy to find us on any of the podcasting platforms, that being Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, And you can always check us out on YouTube. We're now north of 600 subscribers. Our goal is to get to 700 by Christmas Day and then 1,000 by opening day, 2024. So still a ways to go. If you have already followed, if you've already subscribed, send it to somebody who has it because we want to make this thing as big as possible on the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. It's the perfect time to go and create your FanDuel account today. Do it before the weekend. Where we've got some conference championships in college football. We have NFL Sunday. We've got some big time college basketball matchups over the weekend. So go over to FanDuel, create your account, and start placing some bets. A little bit more background on me if it's your first episode ever tuning in. Well, I work here in Kansas City at Sports Radio 810 WHB. We've got a show once a week there. And then also Monday through Friday, I've got a show on ESPN Kansas City, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So you ever want to check? Out what I have to say on other sports, not necessarily related to baseball, you can go find it pretty easily there over at 810 or 1510 AM ESPN, Kansas City. But when you click on this podcast, you know that you are getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball. And for the most part, we always try to bring you new and refreshing content. But that refreshing content uh, can grow a bit stale in the offseason. We know not a lot is going on, but fortunately for us, there was some breaking news. In fact, about... 10 minutes before I started recording this podcast, we were going to lead off with Rule 5 talk, and we're going to talk about that later on in the show today, but we were going to lead off with Rule 5 draft draft picks and who I think the Royals should go after next week in the Rule 5 draft. But we had some breaking news. The Royals did officially sign their first bat of the offseason. How good that bat really is, I'll leave you up to determine that. And that was Garrett Hampson, the former Colorado Rocky and Miami Marlin, now, here's the thing with an off-season plan and how it usually goes, and I would say how it usually goes in Kansas City. You're not going to have your big-time signing on November 29th. At least I would hope not, unless you really went all, all, all the chips in and you went for your big fish early on in the off-season. But for the most part, when you're small market, you wait to see how the market falls. I don't necessarily agree with it. I want the Royals to more so go to the market and let the market come to them. But this is one of those moves I don't – freak out too much about. I know some fans are going to be upset about the overall career numbers, but at the end of the day, Garrett Hampson is coming off a career year for a postseason team last year. Maybe you can attribute that to playing on a much better team and a much better lineup. He had a career high OBP of 349. That would be uh, greatly beneficial for the Royals coming off the bench. They signed him to a cheap deal, one year, two million, not breaking your back over that. But here's what I will say and how I can really get on board with a move like this. Number one, I do not see Garrett Hampson playing every single day. So if that was in your mind, get that out of your mind. He's not going to be taking anybody's spot in the starting lineup. He's depth, and he's done it for quite some time. He's always really been a depth depth piece, excuse me, except from one year in the major leagues. And that was for Colorado, I want to say back in 2021, or it was 19. One of those years at the tail end of the 2010s and the early 2020s. But he had one true year where he was a starter. Other than that, he's been a depth piece. And that's exactly what he's going to be in Kansas City, assuming he makes the roster, which it was a major league contract. My guess is he is going to be on the major league roster. But here's the number two part of this. And I want to give credit to Alex Duvall. Always did a great job running the ship over at Royals Farm Report. Uh, really got you excited for you know the Royals minor league system, the farm system, guys that were coming up. You got you inside on that. And he's still active on Twitter, and I agree wholeheartedly with what he had to say about Garrett Hampson. You know, it's a deal that maybe on the surface doesn't make too much sense, but it also could be a domino type of move. I mean, does it really make sense for the Royals 
to go get their quote unquote super utility guy for a more expensive price, but keep Nick Lofton. They're not going to put Nick Lofton back in AAA. Now, Samad Taylor could be put back in AAA, but those are two guys that had major league experience last year. So what is this telling us? All right, well, if Garrett Hampson is brought into Kansas City, do you keep two super utility guys on the team? I would say no. And it's clear the Royals have kind of made their decision. Maybe they didn't think that highly of Nick Lawson or Samad Taylor. Or the other option is they're lining up a trade. We know the winter meetings are next week. We feel like that could be an area where the Royals could be active. But I think this move looks a lot better if, this is a big if, the Royals bring in Garrett Hampson, fine depth piece, on-base guy last year, can draw a walk. Not really that hard of a hitter, but kind of takes the role of what Nick Lofton maybe could have had. And what if you flip Nick Lofton for some pitching? Now, what if you go out there and get somebody you can compete with in the rotation? I think that would be an upside type of move. And that also brings up the fact of maybe the Royals value Michael Massey a lot more than the public thinks they do. If they value Michael Massey, they value MJ Melendez, they value Kyle Isbell, and they want to go get a corner outfield bat, where does Nick Lofton play? I know I've had a podcast episode on this before and bringing up Nick Lofton and where he could play, and I thought that he could beat out Michael Massey at one point. Absolutely. But I also wasn't, you know, death gripping. Nick Lofton. Nobody can have him. Nobody can take him. If you can get value, right? If you can get pitching, then I think you make that move. I'm not really caught up in who's going to be the bench guy for Kansas City. That that really is irrelevant at this point in the offseason to me. Now, you get into the season and guys start getting hurt, then I'm going to care a lot about how you assembled your bench. But right now, I'm not too worried about it. There's going to be a a revolving door for bench players in Kansas City over 162. That's just a fact. Garrett Hampson may play in April and May and be gone by June. I mean, it's a cheap contract. He's always been a utility guy. He can play everywhere. So if he can play everywhere, he's coming off a career year. I'd imagine he's going to be on the 26-man roster come opening day. Also has elite speed. He's in the 96th percentile there. Royals like their speed guys, but usually those speed guys – Don't get on base a lot. Garrett Hampson last year, though, in his career, wasn't really an on-base guy. He got on base a lot for the Miami Marlins last year. So if this is a domino move, it's a domino move where you acquire Garrett Hampson and then you flip somebody like a Nick Lofton, like a Samad Taylor, or, I mean, think about it. Does it necessarily mean Michael Massey's safe? What if they have higher expectations for Nick Lofton than Michael Massey? They could start... Nick Lofton at second base opening day. And maybe if there was a higher upside or more trade value in Michael Massey, you make that move there. That also would be a possibility. But to me, I think some teams would rather go for Nick Lofton because A, he was a former first round pick. B, he showed good numbers in the limited time he was up in Kansas City. And C, he's barely had his service time clock begun ticking you know he's still a very young player Michael Massey's now been up for basically a year and a half and Nick Lofton's still pretty raw and he's a former first round talent you can still spin that and try to get some pitching value there I I think it can make sense I do not blame you one bit if you're not on board with a move like this because it feels very royal like you go out there and get the speed guy who over his career hasn't been that great offensively he comes to Kansas City like a Chris Owings or like a Matt Duffy and just doesn't play that well, just doesn't provide any offensive value. He's not that great defensively, and he's either stuck on the roster till August or he's gone by May. It it does feel like that, but I will also give credit to the fact that Garrett Hampson's coming off a good year, played in 98 games, and OBP near 350. I mean, no matter how you chalk that up, if it was 60 games, that's fine for a depth piece. If, If Garrett Hampson gave you that in 2024, that's a great bench piece. It just really is. You can't refute that. His OPS plus was 98. I believe the league average is 100, so slightly below that. I think you take that for that price. And I've said this before in the podcast. You try to assemble what the Marlins did last year with how they did their roster. I'm on board with it. Garrett Garrett Hampson was that super utility bench piece for them last year. He could play anywhere, left, center, right, third, short, second. He could bounce around, and he's fast, 
And last year, he could draw the walk a little bit. And if it's a move that can get you to acquire some pitching in the future, if you're trading Nick Lofton soon or Samad Taylor soon or Michael Massey, or maybe it's next week, I don't know. I'm not saying it's it's soon to happen. But the fact of the matter is, this kind of feels like a domino move. If you go out there and acquire a depth piece for more money than what your quote-unquote rookies were making to play the same position, what does that mean for those two guys that were cheaper, Lofton and Samad Taylor? Maybe it's the writing on the wall here. Maybe it does mean a trade is imminent. I guess we'll have to wait and see to see how it unfolds here in the coming days or maybe in the coming weeks. All right, the next thing I do want to talk about is something we were going to lead off with before that breaking news of Garrett Hampson signing a one-year deal worth $2 million to play for Kansas City in the upcoming 2024 campaign. So the Rule 5 draft and who we like in it is coming up next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. And you can follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to the title sponsor today in FanDuel. It's the perfect time with crossover season to go and create your FanDuel account today. So you can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options that includes spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Well, just because there is a roster move, and it's a major league roster move for the Royals, doesn't mean we're going to completely rule out the fact of talking about the future here for a little bit. And I feel like we did that a little bit in the opening segment, talking about Garrett Hampson and what he means for Kansas City and what could be on the horizon. But what I wanted to dedicate today's podcast episode to was the Rule 5 draft. That is going to be coming up here next week. And and that's really what I'm giddy about. That is what I'm excited about. Because that is, A, a look to the future, and B, shows you how good your scouting department could be. Historically, the Royals have not been that great in the scouting department. And since Brad Keller, and I know Brad Keller kind of left a bad taste in everybody's mouth with how things ended in 2023, but for the most part, he was kind of a hidden gem, just on some really bad Royals teams. But we consider Brad Keller to be a number one of this rotation for at least a few years. That's hard to do with a Rule 5 pick. So in this upcoming Rule 5 draft, I think I put a little bit more stock into this scouting department. Maybe that's me being an optimist. Maybe I should be more critical. But the way the Royals found some talent last year does give me hope. The fact they found something in Cole Reagans, and elite stuff in Cole Reagans. The fact they found elite power in Nelson Velasquez and flipped him for Jose Quas, who was never a long-term fit for the bullpen. The fact they got James MacArthur. I mean, all three of those guys are quote unquote like rule five type of talents where they're stashed away in the minor leagues. You know, Reagan's had made his major league debut. I know Nelson Velasquez had, but blocked guys. I mean, these guys in the rule five draft, they're blocked at the major league level. They can't get to the next level because either that team is very expensive and they have stars at their position or they just haven't put together consistent enough years. But it is exciting because you know whoever the Royals take, that theoretically could be a player on their major league roster. It's kind of like a a fun fast track in the major league baseball draft. It's like whoever they take, you're not waiting four or five years to see them get to Kansas City. You're waiting a couple months if they're good enough. But the reason I am buying a little bit more stock in the scouting department, there's different voices there. I know that a lot of people want to say the Royals have the same minds, the same voices. It's a little bit different this year. I've already said it before in the podcast that Brian Bridges, I think, makes this group a little bit more uh, analytical, I would say, looking in the right places. And I think he's going to have some influence there. I think he's going to be in the room or they're already in the room right now talking about guys that are going to be available. That's the beauty of it. The Royals are going to have a pretty high pick. And for the most part, you know, teams in the Rule 5 draft, it's not a team taking a player every single time. You can pass. And maybe, I don't think this is going to happen, but the Royals could pass on both. I know they're going to have to have some 40-man roster decisions, and they're going to need to clear up some spots, because I think I saw this from Royals Weekly on Twitter, a great follow, by the way. Go follow them at Royals Weekly. I think Garrett Hampson puts them at 40. 
And I'm hoping that while I'm doing this podcast, no trade happens, so then all my math is incorrect. But if he's at 40, that means the Royals are going to need to clear up a spot or two for the Rule 5 draft. But I'm sure you're wondering, you know, who are you looking for? And this name to me is the one guy that I have set my sights on. Like, I am going to be disappointed if this particular arm is not going to be going to Kansas City. Because I really, really think he is the hidden gem of the draft. And I think a few people would agree with me. It's Austin Pope. Austin Pope, to me, is going to be able to make a very easy transition to the big league level. I think he is an, an absolute diamond in the rough. You know, he's in the Arizona Diamondback system. Big strikeout guy last year. Had pitched in double A and in triple A. Really good numbers there. Struck out north of 11 guys. ERA was just south of 3-7. Whip was a little bit to deal with just because he was giving him more hits than I would like, but not a high strikeout, high walk guy. That's the difference here. Gets a lot of swing and a miss, or swing and miss, but he also can command the zone. He's younger, 24, 25 years old. So it's not a rule five pick where you're taking some 28, 29 year old. I mean, this is a guy you could get to Kansas City, have a lot of years under control. And that was the beauty when they got Brad Keller. When they got Brad Keller, they had this 23 year old guy that succeeded. And then you have him under control for a long time. It didn't really work out in the end. But for a couple of years there, Brad Keller was your star. He was your star piece. In fact, in the previous coaching regime, that was Cal Eldred's golden child. The way they turned Brad Keller into a double-A prospect and immediately jumped to Kansas City and never really struggled. I think we can see that at a much better level. And I think Austin Pope is a guy that is just the, the best, most stereotypical fit for Kansas City for that bullpen. And, man, it makes you feel so good about your scouting department when you hit on a Rule 5 pick. That doesn't always happen. And a lot of the times the bad team's hitting on somebody and you don't really know who that player is until two or three years down the road. But this is where you go after pitching here. Rule five draft hits, I should say, usually are going to be arms you can stash in the bullpen. You're not taking somebody to go join your rotation. I Not necessarily I'm against going for a rule five pick in the, the hitting department a position player, it just feels less likely they can make that jump. You know, for pitchers, I think that can happen all the time. You could take somebody from double A, you really want the upside, go high A, triple A. That's what I like in Austin Pope. He's pitched in double A and in triple A, had pretty similar numbers. Like, I want to see that in the Royals pick. You know, one guy that came to mind, he had a really good rookie season, like Akil Badu, who plays for Detroit, was in the Minnesota system, 22 years old. They picked him up, but then you saw him tail off a little bit last year. Still rakes against the Royals. But for the most part, I don't think the Royals are in the department of going after somebody in the Rule 5 draft that they're going to start or even put on their bench. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally off base and they love uh, the hitting prospects in the Rule 5 draft. But I'll be quite honest with you. I don't have a long list here. Austin Pope, I think, is, is a really, really good fit. And I think he's going to be there when the Royals pick. And sometimes the Rule 5 draft, I, the reason I don't really have a list is because I can't keep track of all guys that were protected on that, that non-tender deadline, guys that would be available. So I don't want to give you wrong names, but I am almost fully in belief that he is still off the 40-man roster. And, and I think a couple of people would agree with me that he's a really good fit for Kansas City. Okay, He just turned 25 years old, and he'll be that for the entire year. Won't turn 26 till next October. So a young, controllable arm you can put in that bullpen. I really like this stuff. Big swing and miss, can command the zone a bit. He is my pick for the upcoming Rule 5 draft for the Kansas City Royals. Before we wrap up the show and move on to our next segment of the bullpen market, another name is off the board, but for a very expensive price. What does that mean for Kansas City? We will tell you coming up. Before we do that, I want to give a shout out to something we're very excited about here on the Locked On Podcast Network. That's that we've launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Go and do that right after you finish up this podcast episode today. When we come back, we're going to talk about this bullpen market 
And if the signing of Emilio Pagan to Cincinnati means anything for the Kansas City Royals. That's next on Locked on Royals. You are tuning to Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Also catch us on TikTok and on Instagram. We're now live on both those accounts. Give us a follow at Locked underscore on underscore Royals. Well, a little bit of a busy 30 minutes here. Uh, right before we started recording this podcast, it breaks that the Royals had acquired Garrett Hampson through free agency. Now, you don't really acquire somebody. You go out there and sign somebody through free agency to a one-year, $2 million deal. I personally think that shakes up uh, the roster just enough to possibly force a trade. Nick Lofton comes to mind. Uh, Samad Taylor comes to mind. Michael Massey comes to mind. I know some people have floated out Michael Garcia. I'd chop my left arm off if I thought that was really possible. And if the Royals are going to trade Michael Garcia, it better be a you can't refuse that type of deal. But what we do know that is coming with the roster here in the coming weeks, man, I'm hoping they're going to be active in the winter meetings to next week. It's got to be this bullpen and how this bullpen market is going to shake out. Uh, actually, right as I was recording, I saw news from Mark Feinstein that Luis Severino is nearing a deal with the Mets. So moves are going to start happening here. And one move actually happened earlier today as a former Minnesota twin, Emilio Pagan, former Tampa Bay Ray, coming off a really good season for Minnesota, at least numbers-wise, whip was sub-1, ERA was sub-3, pretty good strikeout numbers, uh, didn't walk too many guys. He goes to the Reds on a two-year, $16 million deal. Some interesting numbers about this, though. That $8 million per makes him the most expensive Reds player this year. So the Reds, A, were really fun this year. right? Lots of young talent. You know, Christian Encarnacion Strand. Of course, Ellie De La Cruz, even though he kind of tailed off toward the end of the year. Oh, just not a shortage of talent. Hunter Green in the rotation. You know, you had Nick Lodolo from a, from a point in time. Now, it was a Reds team when they came to Kansas City. They had the spark. They had the flair. They were just fun to watch. And the part of having that success, and when you've got all this young talent, Royals kind of experienced it in, in 2013. When you got that young special nucleus, it allows you to go out there and overspend a little bit. And one area the Reds struggled was their pitching department, was their bullpen a little bit, more, more so their rotation. They definitely need rotational help. I know that they are trying to be in on Tyler Glass now. They're trying to be in on Shane Bieber. It just kind of feels like this is a Reds team that's wanting to make some moves, make some waves here in free agency. And the Emilio Pagan move, I think, makes a lot of sense for Cincinnati. They are in the, the contention window of we need to go be aggressive. We need to go to the market. As I said with the Royals, you want to be aggressive, go to the market, don't let the market come to you. But $8 million would have made Emilio Pagan the third highest paid player on the Royals. And here's another, another number I found out, which is why I'm glad the Royals did not give a bullpen pitcher $8 million a year. A, I know I've done this, this sequence thing of A, B, C, D today, but A, numbers were really bad in save situations last year. I mean, really, really bad. So that tells me Emilio Pagan is a guy that, you throw in there in the sixth inning when it's four to two and they're trailing, get three outs, he's got it done. Or it's seven to two in the ninth, he's got you covered. But when it's the eighth inning, a one run game, you can't turn to him. His ERA was north of seven, and he walked eight guys in 14 innings in save situations last year. He wasn't the closer. We know Johan Duran was, but he was one of those guys. I think his numbers looked really good because he just wasn't thrown out there in the high leverage spots. And if you're going to give somebody $8 million a year, they damn well better be good in high leverage spots. And maybe the Royals did approach Emilio Pagan and that was the asking price, or maybe they were never in on him to begin with. But you could assemble a bullpen without overspending. I know I want the Royals to be aggressive in the bullpen market, that free agency element. I don't want them spending more than $8 million on a player. Unless they're a great closer, which the closers out there, Jordan Hicks, Josh Hader, they're going to warrant a hell of a lot more than $8 million. But Emilio Pagan, to me, is not really an $8 million, $16 million over two-year type of player. And he wasn't really on my list to begin with. It does tell us, maybe with the bullpen market, we saw with Reynaldo Lopez, remember, to Atlanta, he was a three-year, $30 million deal. Some of these guys that I think were entertaining 
that had the on the surface really good numbers, they may be wanting the two or three year deals. And I don't think the Royals need to do that. You can wait a little bit, see what Matt Moore is worth, see what a Phil Maton is worth. I, I think Phil Maton would be kind of in that ballpark of what what Emilio Pagan just got. That, that to me is what my gut is telling me. Phil Maton with his numbers pitching for Houston, and he may want to stay in Houston for that matter. But that kind of feels like a Phil Maton type of contract. I don't see the same contract for a Matt Moore, for a Will Smith, for a Ryan Stanek. You know, those three guys, you've heard me you know, churn those names out over and over and over again. Those, to me, feel like really good options, really good fits. And may it may be a, a guy that kind of comes out of nowhere. The Royals got Nick Anderson. He was never on my radar. Not at any point were they on my radar. Maybe the Royals, like John McMillan, Carlos Hernandez, James MacArthur, Nick Anderson, the Rule 5 pick, that leaves you two or three more spots to go with. Do you stick with who you got here? Do you put uh, Angel Serp on the bullpen and Alec Marsh? Do you go get three more guys through free agency? I'd imagine you know, two or three guys are, are soon to come from free agency. But I am glad the Royals stayed away from Emilio Pagan. That would be one of the most expensive signings of the offseason. Not really on board with that. But again, I'm not harping on what the Reds did. The Reds needed to make a move like that. They need to overpay a little bit because they're so cheap right now. They do not have a lot of expenses, expensive players on their roster. I think it was pointed out by Bob Nightingale of the USA Today that their next most expensive players, like Hunter Green at $3 million. like, And that doesn't really shock me. Maybe the numbers are wrong on that. But you tell me who would be making more. Joey Votto's off the books now. Who else on their team? would warrant more than that. I, I can't really give you one. They had a lot of young guys under club control last year, and that was great for them. Now they can overpay a little bit. The Royals, they still have some guys tied up on contracts. Salvador Perez is one. Jordan Lyles is really the other. And they need to save some money there. And I think throwing in that a bullpen guy and a bullpen guy that wasn't really good in save situations last year, it would have been a bit foolish to me. So glad they, they passed on that. Hopefully here in the coming days, We'll get word that they're at least rumored to be interested in a couple of the guys that I have thrown out there and the Will Smith, the Ryan Stanek, or the Phil Maton. Well, that is going to do it for another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I have been your host, Jack Johnson, and always be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Before we go, though, one last shout out to something we're very proud of on the Locked On Podcast Network, and that's our first ever 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Until tomorrow, where we may have some more moves to go over, you take it easy, Kansas City.